on tap los angeles chapter for the month of may i am dr cameron hummels i will be uh, i'm a computational astrophysicist at caltech and i will be your mc for this evening's event so welcome friends science enthusiasts uh we've got a super cool night tonight with two really cool speakers talking about current and future instruments for observing the cosmos in different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, if this is your first time, I'll give you a brief layout of our schedule for tonight. After a, a couple more announcements by me, um, I will introduce our speakers. We will have one talk uh, for about 15, 20 minutes on SOFIA, the uh, uh, a telescope that's aboard a 747 that goes up into the upper stratosphere and and takes images of, of, of the heavens. And then we'll take questions from you for like five to 10 minutes after that. Um, so I encourage you to write your questions in either the Facebook Live or the YouTube Live chat comments throughout the talk. And I will kind of aggregate them and ask them of our speakers. So then I will introduce our second speaker who will be talking about the lunar, um, uh, uh, a radio telescope, lunar crater radio telescope that's on the that's planned to be on the far side of the moon, taking images um, in the radio part of the spectrum of, of a variety of different things from exoplanets to to the distant universe in the dark ages. So um, again, that'll be about 15 minutes, and then we'll have Q and A where you guys are encouraged to ask questions. So that'll take up kind of our first hour until about 8:30 p.m. Pacific time, and then we will start with pub trivia, which will be interactive. Um, there's a cool website called Mentimeter where you can go in. You don't need to download an app or anything like that. You just go to the website and the questions will pop up for you as we're going through them. And you can click on what you think the right answers are and they will, they will pop up on our screen live as we're broadcasting. And so we'll get an idea of, of, of what people think are the, the correct answers. So um, these events, Astronomy on Tap, as the name suggests, there are a variety of them that are occurring around the world in different locations. Historically, they are held in bars. Um, obviously, this is not a bar right now. This is my apartment, and you are probably in your house as well. So we do encourage people to, to drink beer over the course of the evening, uh, only for those who are of appropriate age for consumption of alcohol, however. Um, but I will be drinking a beer. And yeah, uh, so we have fun with it. Um, these our events happen once a month, but as I said, these if you go to astronomyontap.org.com, I forget exactly which one. There's a list of all the events that are happening, and many of them are live streamed. So even if the one in in Texas or the one in Cambridge or the one in uh, the Netherlands is going on, you can usually connect to them via via virtual streaming. So check that out. Our next event, our next English language event, will be in a month. It will actually be our fifth anniversary, um, and I'm not sure it'll be our 70th event. It'll be our fifth anniversary. I'm not sure what we're going to do that's special for it. But if you have suggestions, please suggest them in the uh, in the the comments below because I I haven't really come up with anything. It only dawned on me this week that uh, that it's our our fifth anniversary. So we should do something cool for that. I don't know what that's going to be yet, but I'm open to to suggestions. Uh, but our next event will be actually in one week's time. We're doing an event entirely in Spanish language. So if you speak Spanish and you're interested in astronomy, or if you know other people who are Spanish speakers and interested in astronomy, please spread the word, advertise for us. Um, I'm doing my best to get the word out, but I uh, don't speak Spanish very well. I will not be the host, um, certainly not well enough to be able to host something like that. So we will have two native Spanish speakers who are also astronomers who are hosting, and then two speakers uh, giving talks on the search for mini black holes in the solar system and brown dwarfs, the, oh goodness, brown dwarfs. It'll be on brown dwarfs. It'll be super interesting. So um, I encourage you to spread the word on that. It's in our YouTube and Facebook postings. Uh, so, so get the word out about those. Um, and last announcement, we also have a sister series of events called the Stargazing Lectures that are a little bit more formal. They're certainly not um, beer drinking that's going on throughout the talks, or I mean, maybe there is, maybe I'm just not privy to it. But our, our next one of those will be on the topic of pulsars and neutron stars, and it will be a week from this Friday. Uh, so 10, 11 days from now, given by Dr. Amruta Zaudan. 
So that should be really cool. And um, I'll put the posting up for it uh, probably tomorrow. Anyway, enough yapping by me. Um, can I invite our speakers to, to, uh, to come on, Saptarshi and Sabrina? Welcome, welcome guys. Hello. Thanks for joining. Um, some very cool backgrounds that you have there. Uh, Sabrina, what is uh, what what do you have there? What is your background? This is the uh, Galactic Center, and I think it's an in infrared, but it's got uh, magnetic field lines laid on top. So oh, that's the, super cool! Yeah, I think this distance from here to here is about one to two parsecs. This bar. Okay. Oh, so it's really, really zoomed in there. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of reminiscent of the image that just came out a month or so ago by the Event Horizon Telescope, where they were showing the picture of the supermassive black hole in neighboring galaxy M87. And I know they're probably trying to do the same with our uh, supermassive black hole in the galactic center like that, um, and showing the magnetic field lines. But I guess that two parsecs is much larger than the space that's resolved by the EHT. So that's okay. super cool, though. That's Was it done with, um, was it done with Sophia? Do you know? Um, yeah, the magnetic field lines were. I'm not sure about the background image, though. Okay, sure. That's awesome. So, Tarshi, what's what's your awesome background? It looks like the moon. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Saptarshi here. So, yes, this is a conceptual visualization of what it might look like when we built it on the moon. Uh, yeah, to hear more about it, uh, tune into the talk. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Are you... Um, are you guys having any beverages like like I am? No, not me, unfortunately. Oh, shoot. It looks like them. I got some weird echo here. Um, well, that's okay. I can. Oh, you have. Oh, modern times, Sabrina. That looks. That looks like. Oh, a good Proto one. Cosmos. So I thought it was appropriate. It's an IPA from uh, Trader Joe's. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, I'm a big fan of Trader Joe's beer. Beer. Uh, it's a lot. That's a lot less expensive than than some of the, the name brand stuff. So that's great. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay, I think that's all of my announcements. I will introduce you, Sabrina. You will be our first speaker. Um, so let's see. Sabrina Pakzad is a mission operations specialist for SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. The majority of her work involves operating the telescope and various instruments, including, oh, I'm gonna mess up these names, EFLS, Hawk Plus, and Forecast. Those are all acronyms. Previously, she worked at Gemini Observatory in Hilo, Hawaii, and for Kitt Peak Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. She received her Bachelor of Science from UCLA in Astrophysics just down the road from here in Pasadena. Um, her Master's in Physics from the University of Natal in Peter Maritzburg in South Africa, and her Master's in Astronomy from the University of Virginia, which is actually where I met Sabrina. We were both there um, I guess a while back but you were, a, you were a student there and I was just a research assistant, a lowly out of undergrad research assistant working there. Um, but, uh, but it was great to make your acquaintance. And then let's see, outside of astronomy, her interests include reading, movies, swimming, and dancing. So um, thank you for joining us. And I'm super excited to hear about Sophia since it's, it's just over the mountains where you guys launch from, right? Doesn't it launch from Palmdale? Yeah, so I'm currently in Palmdale and that's where the, the project is right now. Sweet. Um, I'll go more into that too, um, but thank you. So I'll start. Yeah, please do. Go ahead and share. Right. So again, my name is Sabrina Poxod and I should share. That's right. Can you see everything okay? It looks, looks great. All right. So um, again, my name is Sabrina Poxod and I work for SOFIA, NASA's Flying Infrared Observatory. Now, SOFIA involves these four groups here. I'm gonna use my mouse to point out. Here we have NASA. Um, I think we all know who NASA is, but we have DLR as well. DLR is the um, German equivalent of NASA. Over here, we have USRA, which manages the SOFIA project for NASA. So technically I work for USRA and I'm a contractor for NASA. And then we also have DSI, which manages the um, or they actually are the engineers that built and maintain the telescope and its subsystems. So that's up here in the upper right. So what is SOFIA? 
This promotional video gives a brief overview of what I'm going to cover in my talk. Basically, I'll go over what SOFIA is, what its operations are like, what makes the telescope special, and why we need an observatory such as SOFIA to observe the infrared night sky. I'll also go over the advantages and challenges of SOFIA. And finally, I'll briefly go through the six different instruments that use SOFIA and some of the science highlights that have come from astronomers using data from our observatory. What I'd like for you to take away is how cool this program really is and how amazing the engineers are that built the telescope and modified the airplane. It's a great success that this telescope works so well and that from the very first flight, we have met and often exceeded all the expectations and science requirements. I hope you get a feeling of what it's like to work on a flying observatory. And to the, all the astronomers and teachers out there one day, I hope you get a chance to fly with us. All right, so SOFIA stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It is comprised of a 747 SP that has been modified to contain a 2.5 meter Cassegrain telescope, which is about 100 inches. This picture on the right here shows the telescope or the, the SOFIA flying during the day for testing. Um, it observes in both the visible and infrared, but mostly in the infrared. It's a partnership between the US and German astronomical communities. So NASA receives 80% of the available science time while DLR receives 20%. Uh, the first science uh, test flights were done in 2007 while the first science flight was in 2010. And Sophia's predecessor, which is pictured here on the left, is uh, what's called the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. And it had a telescope that was 2.5 times smaller than Sophia. And this observatory flew from 1975 to 1995. SOFIA is designed to observe in the infrared above 99% of the atmosphere's water vapor at altitudes between 35,000 and 45,000 feet. When in the air, the modified fuselage allows air to flow across the opening of the door, leaving nighttime observations unaffected. The telescope can move in three axes. So it can move in elevation, which is up and down from about 20 degrees to about 60 degrees. It can move in cross elevation about plus or minus three degrees, which isn't a whole lot. So to move more, you have to actually turn the plane. And then also it can move in line of sight about plus or minus three degrees as well. And this photograph and the one in the previous slide are odd because Sophia never flies with the door open during the day because the mirror could be pointed to the sun and blind people, which has never happened and probably never will. But for these flights, this one and the previous one that were taken during the day, the mirrors were either covered or this was before the telescope was fully installed. So what we see is a dummy that was used to test the capability of flying with such a heavy load. Uh, this image shows the different stations where people work on SOFIA. So you can see in the back is the telescope and it's in what we call the cavity. And that is separated from the cabin, which is where the people work by a bulkhead. And so we have two groups of people that work on SOFIA. We have the cockpit crew, which includes the pilot, the co-pilot, the flight engineer, and sometimes the navigator. We have uh, two, what we call mission directors who communicate between the cockpit crew and then the cabin crew. So we've got the cockpit crew that's up at the top and then the cabin crew is everybody on the cabin side or cabin floor. And so the two mission directors sit here. We have a telescope operator, which sits right here. And then we have an instrument operator who sits here. We also have at least one instrument scientist who's in charge of taking the data. Uh, before COVID, we would have principal investigators or PIs of programs come on board SOFIA so that they could be present when their data is taken. And also we have educators who can apply to fly on SOFIA and they would bring back, um, usually they prepare for a year before they go on SOFIA and then they'll take data for their classrooms. So here's the interior of a Boeing 747 as viewed from the back of the plane. And this is what Sophia looks like after it was modified. And this is where you're actually looking towards the back of the plane this time. 
But you can see how much work has been done to modify the plane. So here is where the instrument scientist and the science instrument operator would sit. And then at this station is where one or two uh, telescope operators sit. And then in the background, you can see this part of the telescope is actually the instrument, which attaches to the telescope. And then this is the part of the telescope that sticks into the cabin from the cavity. So we see part of the telescope, but we don't see a majority of it. So I like this video. Uh, it shows the interior of Sophia during a flight with uh, the great instrument and the great team. This was actually taken before COVID, so nobody's wearing face masks. You can see the mission directors are seated in the front here. And in the back, you see the great uh, instrument group. On the side to the left, you see one of the telescope operators standing and the other seated right here. And then in the background, you can see the telescope. And if you're watching the telescope, you'll think it's moving a lot during the flight. And actually, I'll explain why that is an illusion. So Sophia is the largest telescope to be integrated into an airplane. Here we show the telescope from the side. Here is the cavity. And then on the left, we have the cabin. So it shows the light path and the different parts of the telescope. I'll go over this more in the next slide. But basically I wanted to point out that the telescope itself is decoupled from the plane's fuselage with air springs and a large spherical oil bearing, which you can see kind of right here. There's actually a tube that goes through it. And there's also shock absorbers and gyroscopes that help to study the telescope during flight. And this illustration here shows the light path from the same point of view. So light comes in from the top and goes down and hits the primary mirror. From there, it goes up and hits the secondary mirror. And then from there, it goes to the tertiary mirror, which then splits the light into an infrared component and a visible component. And these two components, one, the infrared goes to the science instrument, while the visible component goes to our cameras that we use for guiding or what we call tracking. And um, the design of this telescope is sometimes called a dumbbell design. So when you fly in Sophia, the telescope appears to move while you remain still, but this is the illusion I was talking about earlier. This video shows that the telescope remains still while the airplane and the people on it move during turbulence. And so this is not what you see, but this is actually what's happening. So uh, what do we see on our screens? The beginning of this video here shows stars streaming by in one of our cameras. And this is what we see when the airplane is turning. Uh, when we're finished turning and when we're on what we call on leg and the plane is at a steady heading, the telescope is put into a state called inertial and then we can start setting up on the science target. So you can see the science target here is a galaxy of some sort, I'm not sure which one. Um, an object, usually a star, is used for guiding on, or what we call tracking. And once we're set up on tracking, then we hand off the telescope to the science instrument team. Their instrument can communicate with the telescope and command it to chop. And this is why we actually see two images. So chopping is a technique I'm not going to go into, but it is used often in infrared astronomy and observing. So. Where is uh, Sophia? Most of the time we fly out of Palmdale, which is right outside of Los Angeles, California. So you can see Los Angeles is here. You just need to go over the mountains and we're here in Palmdale, California. Our building is technically a remote part of NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, which is on nearby Edwards Air Force Base, which I think you can see up here, right there. And um, the scientists and the science flight planners and various managers of Sophia call Ames their home. And that's not on this map, that's too far north in also in California. Um, in the past, we've had deployments and most commonly we go to Christchurch, New Zealand, where we study objects in the Southern hemisphere, such as the Galactic Center. Uh, this past winter, we went to Cologne, Germany, 
where we were um, able to work with the great team. The great team is actually from Germany and they couldn't come to the US because of COVID this past year. So they, we came to them and observed from Cologne. And then we've also done short uh, deployments called suitcase deployments, such as to Daytona Beach, Florida in 2017, where we observed the atmosphere of Neptune's moon Triton as it cast a, fa a faint shadow on the Earth's surface. Our next deployment will be to the Southern Hemisphere for about eight weeks in August and September of this year. Here we have two flight plans for two different nights of observing. So keep in mind that to observe different objects, the plane has to turn. So for the one on the left, you see we have a climb leg where we uh, take off from Palmdale, California, and then we turn to observe a certain object. And then we turn again to observe a different object. So each flight plan or each night is a different flight plan, different path. And a science flight planner plans these flights in months in advance. Um, I liked in another talk I saw online, uh, somebody said this was an optimization problem. How do you fly optimally so that you observe the science targets in a pattern that will take us back home each night? You need to account for no fly zones across the US and the no fly zones are actually these magenta and orange shapes that you see on the maps. And we also can't fly over Mexico, but we can fly into um, Canada. And here are two flight plans, but this time out of Christchurch, New Zealand. So we spend about two months in the Southern Hemisphere each year to observe objects that cannot be reached from the Northern Hemisphere. And these long legs you see, this is a leg by the way, these long legs are of the galactic center. So you can see how popular it is to observe. Um, something like this leg would be about an uh, hour or two, whereas this leg is at least three hours of observing just the galactic center. And then also I want you to take note that how much easier it is to fly out of Christchurch. Uh, there's less restricted airspace, there's less air traffic. You don't see as much magenta and orange on these maps. Here's a video that shows you um, Sophia uh, flying in a different flight path. This one kind of looks like a cartoon star. Um, at the top right, you see the science objects or the science targets or what we call legs. So each time we switch from one leg to another, Sophia makes a turn on the map. Um, below this, you see the uh, altitude of Sophia. And so each time we uh, fly, we burn fuel. And as we burn fuel, we can climb higher and higher in altitude. Below this is just a picture of the, the uh, instrument that was used, which I think is called forecast in this case. Yeah. So I'll just skip to the next slide. So there are both benefits and challenges to operating SOFIA. Unlike a ground-based observatory, SOFIA can get above a large portion of the atmosphere. It can also travel to anywhere on Earth for such events as occultations, which is when a solar system object passes in front of a background star. And these often happen in the middle of the ocean. Unlike a space-based observatory, the instruments can be switched out regularly for maintenance and upgrades. We can also invite guests to fly with us. Educators spend a year with their classroom preparing experiments, and they study a lot of things such as radiation on board SOFIA or the Earth's atmosphere. Now, the challenges include airplane maintenance. There are not many 747 SPs left in the world, and uh, our plane is older, and so it does require a little bit more maintenance than a regular plane. Air traffic control, um, we fly regularly in the US and Canada when we're stationed out of Palmdale. So air traffic control is used to our strange flight plans. And they often ask us about what, we're, what kind of science we do. But when we're on deployment, especially in Europe, we need to file our flight plans much earlier and we enter into multiple countries airspace and so we're dealing with multiple um, permissions and multiple accents at that too. And despite all these issues, we still had a successful de German deployment this past February of this year. 
Now, turbulence is not so much of an issue. It can cancel flights if it's severe, and weather can cost us time if we need to divert from our flight plan. And finally, Sophia is expensive, I'll admit that. Uh, balloons are cheaper, but I still don't think they're as good. So why do we do all this? Infrared light from the sky is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So this is why it is hard to observe from the ground at a site like Mauna Kea in Hawaii. But at the altitude that Sophia flies at, we can see this galaxy in infrared light because we are above 99% of the absorption. So here is a list of the six instruments that are currently um, available to Sophia, five that can be installed at any one time, and one that is always on board. So we have XC's FIFLS and Forecast, Great or Upgrade, and Hawk Plus. And then the FPI Plus is actually a part of our imagers that we use for guiding on, or tracking on a star. So that is always on the plane. But the rest of these five are always, one of them is at, at least on the plane at any time. Uh, next, I just wanna show you this slide that shows all of the instruments on a plot of resolving power versus wavelength. Basically, the more area we cover on this graph, the better. And you can see that Sophia does a good job of covering regions not covered by other telescopes, um, such as JWST and ALMA. And then I want you to note that Hawk recently um, released a press release, I believe, that uh, says that it's going to get an exciting upgrade that allow it to study magnetic fields in distant galaxies four times faster than its current rate. So with science with Sophia, there there's a lot to talk about, and I found it difficult to narrow it down to a few. Um, this is one of my personal favorites. It was presented in Nature Astronomy by Casey Honobal, I believe. And the paper is called Molecular Water Detected on the Sunlit Moon by Sophia. The results of this will help NASA understand more about the water on the surface of the moon, which is crucial for future missions such as the Viper Lunar Rover and the Artemis program. Now, um, science with Hawk is very exciting because Hawk can measure magnetic field lines. So on the left here, we see an image of NGC 1068 with magnetic field lines superimposed on top. And I have here that this is the first time magnetic field tracing of star formation regions along the spiral arms was taken of this galaxy. And then on the right here, we have Centaurus A, a merger galaxy with a warped magnetic field. And this work was done by Enrique Lopez Rodriguez et al. and was published in 2020 and 2021. And finally, I wanted to talk about occultations a little bit. Um, in 2015, Sophia observed the occultation by Pluto of a bright star. This allowed astronomers to measure various details of the dwarf planet's atmosphere, such as pressure, density, and temperature profiles. This plot shows the light curve on the left, oh, sorry, the right. And uh, this middle flash in, in the center flash is, uh, confirms the precise position of Sophia on the center line of the shadow's path. And I think it's amazing that despite Pluto's shadow moving at 53,000 miles per hour across the ocean, we were still able to get us put at the right place at the right time so we could observe the occultation for 120 seconds. And that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Sabrina. That was super cool. It's, it's super interesting that to see the video of the flight path of, of this and it, how it switches target for every little every little um, turn in its in its flight. That's pretty interesting. Um, okay, so lots of questions. Uh, I encourage people, there are already people asking questions in the in the chat, both on YouTube as well as Facebook. Continue to do that, and I will ask those questions of Sabrina. Uh, let's see. So I guess you kind of answered this, but just, just to clarify, how long does each flight last from oh, uh, Leo Miguel Bernardes? That's a really good question. Um, before COVID, they, the flights were about eight and a half hours. Um, up to, I believe, nine or 10 hours. From wheels up to wheels down is about 10 hours with about eight and a half hours of science taken. Um, right now, the flights are about eight and a half hours. So 
maybe seven and a half hours of science. It takes time to take off and land. Um, you know, we have to prepare the telescope. The telescope has to be uh, braked during takeoff and takeoffs and landings. Um, and then we kind of take the brakes off as we um, are observing so that it can float on that oil bearing. I see, just so there's not any kind of vibrations that are introduced into the, into mm -hmm. the cool. Um, related to this, uh, there are a couple questions. Are there any, uh, Andrew Redemeyer asks, are there any high altitude weather or other events that can interfere with observing like in the stratosphere or is there turbulence in the stratosphere compared to down here in the troposphere that might mess up your observation? Um, it never really messes us up so much. It can be severe, in which case we avoid those areas. Or if it's going to be bad, we've canceled flights because of severe turbulence in the weather prediction. So before we take off, we have a mission briefing. And uh, we always have a weather person talk about the weather prediction for that night. And um, they'll warn us if there's going to be turbulence, if it's going to be light, or if it's going to be moderate. And if it's severe, we have to take that into account. Sometimes there have been thunderstorms that we had to divert around. Um, so it depends. Most of the weather though is below us because we're up high at, at least like 39,000 feet for a majority of the flight. There are some instruments that like to go higher or there are some scientists who pressure the pilots to go higher. So at max, we're not supposed to go past 45,000 feet. And even then there are some pilots that don't like to go that far because they, they say Sophia doesn't like to go that high. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I guess it produces additional stresses on the on the system because the higher you go, well, I guess when you're that high, the temperature doesn't get any colder. It starts to warm up a little, but it's already super cold. Is that is that one of the main limitations? Is just temperature stresses on the system as you go higher with that big open? Yeah, I don't I don't know about it's the pilots are concerned about the plane. They're not too worried about the telescope so much, but the plane and and the door, they want to make sure these things don't break in in flight, obviously. So um, I don't know. Some people say it's it's smoother at 45,000 feet. Some people say it's bumpier, but I, I know the higher we get, the better the data is. So, okay. okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. There's less atmospheric absorption and, and whatnot that, that can cause problems. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so some questions were, why not have, let's see, uh, there's a lot of questions about glass. If there should be glass, like separating the telescope or not separating the telescope from, from the vacuum, well, not vacuum, but from the, the outer, outer part of the atmosphere. Yeah, I actually never thought about that. Um, I know our door is kind of like, similar to like a garage door and it mm -hmm. opens. And when it opens, nobody notices on the plane. <laughs> it's kind of incredible. Even the pilots are like, oh, it's open? Like they're the ones in charge of opening it, but um, yeah, nobody notices. I, I think it's the aft bulkhead does a really good job of separating the cabin from the cavity. We don't notice the cold at all. Sometimes they, the instruments like it cold, but the telescope, you know, is separate from us. So the instruments though are on the side of the cabin. So if they like it cold, then it has to be cold. But besides that, we don't really notice anything. So I don't know if glass would be an advantage or not. So yeah, it's like it could add another refracting layer or an opacity source, depending on the glass that you use. I don't know. Um, yeah, it'd I be cool to have that. glass between the cabin and the cavity so we could see the telescope. Um, but then that would introduce light from the cabin, and that wouldn't be good either. So yeah, battery. Yeah, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be great. Um, Ashley L asks, why is it easier to observe the galactic center from New Zealand? and the Southern Hemisphere, presumably other than like, as opposed to off the coast of Carroll. Well, we could observe from here. I think it's lower in the sky if we're at this part of the earth. And so you're looking through more of the atmosphere and our telescope can only go down to like, you know, 20 degrees. It can't go past that. So that limits us. And the higher an object is in the sky in general, the better it is for uh, the data. So um, there are other objects in the Southern Hemisphere as well. I think like the Magellanic Clouds, you can't see at all 
from uh, the Northern hemisphere. So there are benefits. It's not just the galactic center, just that's the most popular object in the sky. Sure. Um, Michael Cho asks, how can educators apply for being on, like getting time on this? Uh, because it seems pretty awesome. Or is it just scientific applications? You know, uh, No, we have uh, teachers of all classrooms will apply. I think it's through the SETI program. And I'm trying to see if I can find more information. Maybe I'll type it into the chat later. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so we'll try and, we'll, Michael, we'll try and seek out that link for you or, or, or whatnot so we can get it to you by the end of by the end of the session. If we can't, I'll, we can post it after, after the event in the, in the comment section. So we'll have a good answer for you. Yeah, or you can Google uh, Sophia SETI uh, ambassadors, I think they're called. And um, I hope we, we bring that program back after COVID is over and done because it was really fun to have them. And they, they come on board and ask us questions and um, talk about what it was like to be a teacher and how excited they were to, to be on board. I thought, you know, that was a great, great program. I hope they bring back. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, okay, last question. Uh, Allison Esquivel asks, if you were to change anything about Sophia, what would you want to address first and why? Oh, wow. What can I say I to not get in trouble? <laughs> 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 um, Better on better on flight food for the to the mission mission yeah. operation staff. Well, we have to bring our own food, but they do provide the coffee, and uh, the coffee you know it's nice to have, but it could be improved slightly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the program is really great. I mean, I actually didn't uh, mention this, and I I'm now thinking, oh, I should have put it in a slide. You know, if we're in the southern hemisphere and or northern hemisphere, and we go far enough north or south, we see. The northern lights and you know everybody gets a chance to stop what they're doing and go to the first class and where the lights are turned off and you can take some really amazing pictures i'll bet um, i guess it's probably not good for observations but uh well actually i don't know in terms of those transitions that occur for the aurora presumably it's all in the opticals are there maybe there are infrared counterparts i don't know is it is it problematic when you get to the point where you can see the aurora that you have to stop doing observations in the infrared because it's like only if it drowns out the, the signal on our guiding cameras or tracking cameras, then we can't track on a star, which makes it hard to take science. But it's never been that bad. Like we might see a little bit of it. And I, I can't remember if anyone has said that they see it in the data. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to look into this to find out if there's an infrared like component to, uh, to a rural glow. I just think of it as optical, but I don't yeah. know what. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much, Sabrina. That was awesome. Um, yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah. Saptarshi, do you want to come back on? Hey, very Welcome nice back, time. Sir. Sup Welcome back. Sabrina. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to transition now to uh, Saptarshi giving his his presentation on the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, which you can see in his, in his background here. Uh, so let me introduce Saptarshi. So Dr. Saptarshi, I'm gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna give it a shot. Bandio Padye is a robotics technologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, California Institute of Technology, where he develops novel algorithms for future multi-agent and swarm missions. He received his PhD in aerospace engineering in 2016 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, where he specialized in probabilistic swarm guidance and distributed estimation. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering in 2010 from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, India, where as an undergraduate, he co-founded and led the Institute's student satellite project, Pratham, which was launched into low earth orbit in, 20, in September, 2016. Saptarshi's current research interests include robotics, multi-agent systems and swarms, dynamics and controls, estimation theory, probability theory, and systems engineering. He's published more than 40 papers in journals and refereed conferences. So uh, I'm sorry for butchering your last name, Saptarshi, Saptarshi, but I'm really excited to hear about, uh, like I'm super excited about the idea of having a telescope on the, on the far side of the moon a radio telescope to do some some of the super cool science that you're going to talk about here. So take it away. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, 
and uh, no, you didn't butcher my name. My name is Saptashi Bandopadhyay. And uh, uh, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to talk about this interesting project that we are working on at JPL. Um, I want to immediately draw your attention to the large team at the bottom. So although I, I happen to lead this team, uh, all of this work wouldn't have been possible without this incredible team that I have the pleasure of working with. Um, so let's dive deeper into what this idea is. And uh, I'll try to stay within uh, my prescribed time limit. Uh, so, um, so you just heard a talk, a great talk on infrared uh, astronomy uh, from Sophia. And this is the opacity, atmospheric opacity. So these are the wavelengths that allow that are allowed through to reach Earth. So you can see radio waves can reach Earth. There's a large region on the infrared that you can't observe from Earth. So Sophia flies over here somewhere. Um, what we are interested in is looking at the 10 meter wavelengths at longer. So that is again the region of this atmosphere or the electromagnetic spectrum that you can't see uh, from Earth. In fact, uh, why? Because Earth is a very big, uh, uh, both a noise source and the ionosphere is a very big absorber. So uh, when, a, when a wavelength larger than 10 meters approaches Earth, the ionosphere absorbs it and then it re-emits it in some random direction. So it's basically a noise source and we can't deal with it. So this is the Earth's noise that we are talking of. So one of the best, best places to put a telescope to observe at wavelengths larger than 10 meters would be to go onto the far side of the moon. As you guys know, uh, the far side of the moon is uh, tidally locked. So this side will never face Earth. So this moon is a nice physical shield that shields the telescope from Earth and Earth noises. And if we take observations during the night, it also shields it from the sun. So this is a great place to put a telescope like this. Uh, so that is what uh, LCRT is all about. It is trying, it is a lunar crater radio telescope. Um, so why a crater telescope? So you have, you guys must have uh, read, read about Arecibo, now uh, sadly decommissioned Arecibo, which uh, recently uh, was one of the largest telescopes on earth. It was around 300 meters in diameter. Currently FAST holds the record of being 500 meter in diameter. LCRT, if ever built, would be one kilometer in diameter. So it would be the largest filled aperture telescope in the solar system. So clearly an idea like this has been around for quite a, some, quite a long time. Here are some images from actually from 1960s. Uh, this image is tagged to 1984 that show this idea has been around. Uh, and the key issues with many of these ideas at that time uh, were these four technical challenges. And during this talk, I hope to convince you uh, that we have solved the technical challenges that many of the people who have gone ahead of us have thought about but haven't been able to solve. Um, most of it thanks to being in the right place at the right time. These challenges uh, were really big and difficult uh, at that point of time. So, for example, selecting lunar craters on the far side of the moon. Uh, remember, this is the 1980s, 1990s. We really didn't know what it looked like. These Arecibo type support structures are difficult. You just, we just saw one of them you know, fall in Arecibo. So clearly that is a hard problem. Uh, there's a thermal strain compensation problem. That is on, on the lunar surface, the temperature fluctuates over 300 degrees centigrade from lunar day to lunar night. Uh, remember moon has a 30 day, day night cycle. So for 15 days, you have lunar day where the temperatures are like 200 degrees centigrade. And for 15 days, you have lunar night where the temperatures are like minus 100 degrees centigrade. So pretty large fluctuations. And then rim to flow transportation. Clearly, if you want to build something on a crater, you have to be able to go down a crater or go up a crater. So that's, that's hard. And uh, during this talk, I hope to convince you that uh, we kind of know how to solve these problems right now. So with this, let me just give you a peek, uh, peek view of what, RC, what LCRT would look like. So we would be in a three to five kilometer diameter crater. There'd be a large mesh of one kilometer size, uh, one kilometer diameter that would be deployed inside the, in, this, in this crater. There's also a receiver feed system that is suspended over the crater. Here is a side view of the entire system where you see the mesh and the suspended receiver. And immediately one of the first things uh, jumps out. We don't really need foundational elements uh, to build like the like large structures that were necessary in Arecibo. Why? Because the entire system is suspended inside a crater. So our trick was finding a, a crater that was large enough 
so that you could both ho house the mesh, which is at the bottom of the crater, and a feed system, which is like approximately 600 meters above the crater, about the mesh. So both of those things would nicely sit inside the crater. So then you can get rid of all those large foundational elements. A uh, moon has lower gravity than that of Earth, one sixth the gravity. So suspending things on a, inside on moon is significantly easier too. Uh, so as you can see, I'm a technologist by training and, and an astronomer by, by interest. So I like to bring in all these engineering tricks to solve really challenging problems. And you'll see many of them uh, towards in this presentation. So this gives you an idea of what it looks like. Um, uh, recently, there was a nice paper uh, or a nice uh, series uh, published by the Royal Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society on different ideas on uh, looking at astronomy from the moon and uh, LCRT was featured on that. So let me now dive into what is the science that something like this would do? Of course, something like this has to answer some fundamentally important question, otherwise it won't be built. So on the bottom over here is an evolution of, is an image showing the evolution of the universe. And this is the present day on the extreme right. And uh, this is on the extreme left is uh, the Big Bang. And this is a cosmic microwave over here. So there are a bunch of uh, missions over here that are trying to capture different wavelengths or different snapshots of the universe. And you can see there's large region over here where there is no data of the universe currently available. Um, these, the data that we have been able to generate like the Hubble ultra deep field image, uh, which is on one end of the spectrum. And then there is a cosmic microwave background radiation, which is on the other end, uh, you know, straddling the region that we can't observe. Uh, those have generated nice uh, Nobel prizes and have uh, really advanced our understanding of cosmology. But clearly there's a lot of stuff hidden over here that we don't understand. And that's kind of uh, what we are targeting. That's the science that we are targeting. So let me try to explain what is it that we expect to see here. So uh, you might be aware of this neutral hydrogen 21 centimeter line, which is basically a hydrogen, a neutral hydrogen atom uh, when it just, uh, when the spin flips of an, in the electron of the hydrogen atom, it emits a 21 centimeter uh, photon or a wavelength. Uh, that's the, that's the most ubiquitous signal that you can find out there. Uh, but what happens is because of special relativity or, or something like Doppler redshift, uh, as this wavelength, as this light, the thing that is emitting the light, as it moves away at a certain velocity, you see a Doppler redshift. That is a 21 centimeter line would increase in wavelength. So it would become, say, for some, some given velocity, it would become 30 centimeter, one meter, uh, something like that. So what is causing this uh, velocity increase? Um, we don't really know what exactly is causing the velocity increase, but we know that that is happening. So Hubble proved that, uh, or Hubble uh, discovered that uh, the, all the galaxies that are away from us are, are moving away at faster and faster speed. In other words, if a galaxy is very far away from Earth, it's moving away faster than a galaxy that is closer to Earth. Um, we really don't, as, as to my best knowledge and understanding, we really don't understand why this is happening. And so these are big open questions in cosmology. So what, what happens is that 21 centimeter wavelength, which is like about this big, that wavelength, because if it's coming from these extremely far away uh, sources would be increased because of uh, redshift to 10 meters or longer. Just, just think of it. It's like 21 centimeter and it's not just one meter. It's, it's been increased to you know, tens of meters. So you might ask, what is the, uh, what is the uh, red shift at which this happens? It turns out at red shifts over uh, say 20 to 30, all the way up to 1000, you see these kind of features. And these are like the first stars that were ever discovered, that were ever you know, starting to give out light in the universe. So the, so the universe was created after Big Bang. And then there was this region where there was just neutral hydrogen roaming around. And then the first stars were getting created. So this region is called a cosmic dark ages. And this region is called the region of first stars. And that is the light that we are trying to capture. Um, I do want to leave you the, leave this slide with one more point. Although LCRT is targeting this region, there are many other mission concepts also, which are very good and are, are targeting this, this, this mission. There are some sparse dipolar array concepts that are, that are actually Caltech is leading one of them. And there are some lunar uh, satellite constellation concepts. Um, with this, uh, I also uh, would like to say why this matters. Um, why do we need to study that? Uh, we kind of look, 
live on the world in the present stage where we see a random display of where galaxies are located all over the world sorry all over the universe but we don't know which of these approaches we took did we did we end up taking any of these different models of what the expanding universe theory would look like and there are some ideas that um, some of the data that we will be generating could help answer that another fundamentally open question about the universe is uh, what is the universe made of so we know that around 4% of the universe is made out of matter that we understand and there's a large component of dark energy and dark matter that we do not understand and um, there might be hints about this uh, in in the data uh, in the, once we study those wavelengths uh, so with that let me now dive a little more deeper into exactly what science we would do so i talked about two different regions there would be a dark ages signal and a signal from the first stars so it turns out the signal from the first stars could be it's not really clear but it could be observed also from earth by and some and an instrument called edges has taken some data on this to fit this data a number of cosmological models have been proposed and you can see these cosmological models have wildly different uh, answers when you when you predict what should be the signal from the dark ages so the object of lcrt is to observe this signal and understand what is which is the best cosmological model that fits the data or do we need new science in that region uh, note uh, this is a this is a this is an evolution of the of the 21 cm line over different uh, red ships that is very different from the cosmic microwave background which is a single measurement at a single red shift um, and uh, then we will uh, basically all of this will help us understand fundamental aspects of our universe like state of the intergalactic medium large scale structures and dark matter physics and inflation so but this data is not going to come easy the biggest challenge is going to be our own galaxy it turns out our own galaxy produces 10 raised to power 5 times more more signal or more noise in the wavelengths that we are interested in measuring so this is the galactic signal foreground our milky way galaxy signal this is the signal we are trying to observe so we kind of know what that signal looks like so we might be able to remove it after a lot of observations but again these are all guesses and our best modeling results so what we also want to do is place the telescope in such a crater so that it is significantly far away from the strongest sources which are the galactic center we just saw a nice uh, description of the galactic center in the previous uh, slide so it's nicely connects to that so we are planning to put our satellite somewhere oh, sorry our telescope somewhere between 0 to 20 degree north latitudes on the crater on on the moon so that we can look a large look at a large region of the sky but we are away from this strong galactic signal so with that i kind of uh, narrowed in on the on the key signs that lcrt would do um we have covered you know like we we need approximately one year to collect all the data that we need to uh, on the moon and uh, we'll only be taking observations during the night uh, i'll i'll ditch the remaining scientific words here and let's now dive deeper into the technology aspects of it so remember we talked about uh, finding craters on the far side of the moon is difficult so luckily uh, nasa had launched this uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter spacecraft uh, around 2009 uh, and and we now have beautiful high resolution imagery of the of the far side of the moon here are some images shown shown here um turns out we are interested in 3 to 5 kilometer craters and there are around 82000 craters for us to select from so we did a selection we i don't want to go through details but we basically picked up 50 of our favorite craters and then we looked at every one of them in detail and this is the crater we really liked uh it's approximately 3.8 km in diameter and it's 900 meters in depth I remember i was talking about how the mesh to to focus uh, distances around 5, 600 meters so you can see now the entire thing nicely sits inside the crater and we still have a uh, vertical height to spare uh, which is a very neat thing to, to find on a crater another interesting problem was the problem of temperature regulation and let's talk about that so here is a cross section of the crater uh, with showing the mesh and the receiver and how everything would look um one of the things that you might know is if you take a piece of wire and you hold it like this it takes on a catenary shape uh turns out if you just change the mass of the of the mesh you can give it almost any shape you like uh, for example here is a 
if you had a linear density of one by cos squared theta, you would give it a circular shape. Uh, you can see where this is going. We want a parabolic shape. So you do the math. Turns out this is a more interesting looking uh, image. A uh, bunch of equations. I won't go through the equations, but the point being with this, again, an engineering trick, you can recreate a parabolic mesh. And the, and the good part about this is because everything is happening passively, the mesh shape does not really depend on the temperature. It will still continue to maintain its temperature irrespective of the temperature fluctuations on the bone. Again, a passive way to solve a pretty hard problem. So this is how the mesh would look. Uh, it's it's an intensely dense mesh, but a problem that a mesh of this size has is we are looking at a one kilometer mesh, but uh, our components, uh, each of these wires are uh, millimeters in size. And more importantly, that to make that uh, temperature fluctuation idea work, the, the wire mesh has to change by a few millimeters here and there, like 1.1 to 0 0.9 millimeters, and then the mesh takes on the parabolic shape, which is very hard computationally, because now we are handling a six orders of magnitude uh, component, uh, you know, a kilometer scale versus a millimeter scale wire. Um, so, Clearly, this is not work done. We are just uh, starting our NIAC phase two project on this. We have four interdisciplinary constraints that really hit us. Uh, there's the part about structural and thermal analysis, which is uh, how will this thing survive on the lunar surface? There's a part about deployment. How will you deploy something like this on the lunar surface? There's a part about RF frequency or the radio frequency performance. All of this is to collect radio signals. So how, does the, how do the radio signals look? And then there's also the part that it has to be launched and it has to survive launch. So our current uh, focus is on designing something that survives all of this. Uh, we are drawing inspiration from GMRT, which has a, this rib uh, and mesh structure, which, is, which might be very useful to what we want to do. So with this, I'll quickly jump through some of the robotics that we need to make something like this happen. Um, the concept of operation is to essentially have a spacecraft uh, arrive onto the lunar near the crater and break into two parts. One part would land in the center of the crater. One part would land on the side surface. And they would deploy these nice rovers called do axles. And these rovers would go down along the crater rim and then tag onto these lift wires and then pull these lift wires up and then the entire thing would deploy. I know you must be wondering what are these robots? And that was really one of the big challenges, rim to flow transportation. So this is a still of the duaxial robot. Let me show you the robot in, in function. Uh, while this video goes on, I can talk a little bit about it. So this robot, as you can see, has four wheels, but then it can settle down and two of the wheels would uh, open out and then they can go over the crater rim and start going downwards. So this is a field test done in the Mojave Desert. And uh, you can see here, the, the two parts just go down. So you could imagine that there would be on the other side of the, like at the bottom of the crater, there would be the, the spacecraft holding the wire mesh, which is the reflector system. And this uh, robot will go pull those lift wires and bring them up all the way into the crater rim again and, and then anchor them on the crater rim. So that's the main idea of using these robots. Again, I was serendipitously, these robots are being built at JPL for the last two decades. And now we happen to have a phenomenally good use of them among other ideas that, that were proposed. There are some other ideas on what we could do. Uh, like all of the ideas over here from column two to column uh, three, four are all including robots. We could also think of using things like projectiles. So we are looking at many other ideas on how we could deploy something complex like this, but it, uh, it suffices to say that uh, we kind of, uh, that is again, one of the major things that we are working on right now. Um, what we have right now is uh, a deployment system that looks like this. We would first have the antenna packaged into this lander that would sit right at the bottom. Then we would have these robots come out and deploy these lift wires. Then these lift wires would get anchored all around the crater rim, and then the entire thing would get deployed. Um, I want to show some some interesting videos on what different lift lifting mechanisms exist out there. Uh, so here is a very nice, uh, interesting design that shows you could do a lot of interesting uh, stuff with uh, lifting uh, large, heavy objects using tethers, and that's the kind of stuff that we want to utilize for our work. Uh, you would wonder how do you deploy something that big, like a like a kilometer scale? And some of you might have already guessed it. We'll use an origami fold structure. So it turns out origamis are these really nice, uh, uh, really nice system to 
both save, conserve volume and space when you're launching something on a on a rocket. But at the same time, once it once it gets launched, you could potentially have it open up and take up a large space. And we are actively researching this. Here is some origami fold structures uh, done in finite element analysis that shows what we expect to happen. This is just a hundred meter scale model. We're nowhere close to a kilometer scale yet, but we have obviously a project of this magnitude. We are working towards it. So it turns out this, this structure has an instable, interesting bistable phenomena that as you open 90% of the structure, the remaining 10% opens up on its own. Uh, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. A bistable system means you will be there. one of the stability modes is the large open structure. So once everything is open, it won't it won't try to fall on into on itself. But it's also a difficult thing because we now have to control this bistability. Here is another interesting design that that is more obvious, I think, to understand how the origami comes into play. This is actually a kilometer scale structure that uh, we're just trying to. Uh, see what could we pot potentially do if we didn't have to make these intermediate folds. So those are the minor folds, you know, that that were in the previous slide. Uh, so with this, uh, I'm, I come to a close. Uh, we are all working towards creating this interesting uh, lunar crater radio telescope on the far side of the moon. Um, I showed you some uh, an idea to deploy a one kilometer wire mesh on some suitable crater that we have found. Um, if we succeed, this would open a new window into uh, observing the universe into wavelengths that we really don't have an idea of what's happening right now over there. And this would be the largest field aperture telescope in the solar system. And we think something like this will create a lot of public excitement. Finally, I'd like to thank my team. It's an, it's an incredibly awesome set of people that I get to work with every day. And together, we are making LCRT a reality. So thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions. That was super cool, Saptarshi. Really cool. I especially like that robot. The robot that was like zooming around and then it's one axle went down into the crater to drag the, the cable yeah. with. Yeah, if you actually search do axel and search JPL, you'll see some really cool videos online. It's a, it's a pretty neat robot. Yeah. So how many how many of those robots need to deploy in order to, to drag the cables down to, to make these support structures? Yeah. So that's a that's an interesting question. So the so the, the answer obviously depends on how much money we have. Right. If we if we had like five billion dollars, then we could deploy 20 of those robots and make the construction happen in less than one lunar day. Why would we want to do that? Because these robots are not designed to survive the lunar night. As I told you, the lunar night has those really bad temperature cycles and most probably most things die. Um, on the other hand, if we launch only two of them, then we would take about uh, five months, five Earth months or around 74 days to deploy the entire structure. So, so it's, it's a trade-off among all other things. Uh, we don't expect to have $5 billion for a mission like this. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's one of the things that we are actively working on, how to make these things somehow survive and also uh, do it very efficiently so that we can make the structure efficiently. I see, I see. But nominally, they would be powered, powered by lithium-ion batteries that are charged by solar or something like this? Yes, everything would be solar powered. There'd be, there'd be batteries on wood. Uh, so the point, during construction, we need sunlight. Otherwise, we can't really see what's happening. So having them uh, powered by sunlight makes a lot of sense. And during night, anyway, nothing's going to be working. Uh, so so we, we do want to stick to solar power. It's also much easier to deal with uh, compared to the other power sources. So yeah, that's a preferred option as of now. But during operations, it, would the telescope not be operating during lunar day where the solar, where the sun is a major radio source and yeah. you don't want it in the field of view? Yeah. So our plan is to operate only during the night to collect the science data that we want to collect, which is the, the, the you know, the early universe signal and integrate only during the night. But uh, if we do launch a telescope like this, I'm, I'm quite sure we will be switched in, switching it on also during the day because we don't have any moving parts. Again, that's again what design choice because uh, moving parts die very fast on the moon. The lunar dust is uh, very sharp uh, because it has never been eroded, right? So it's been eroded only by micrometeorites. So it's very sharp and it tends to get into all the gearboxes of everything and just kill, kill all moving equipment. So uh, after construction, everything will be just uh, stationary. And uh, so we'll collect data both during... So our main data is 
being collected during lunar night and uh, we don't know what to expect once we switch it on during the lunar day actually it's it's that that's how little we know about those wavelengths that's fair yeah i guess the ionosphere just blocks everything so if exactly gonna... and even earth orbiting satellites get so much noise interference from ionosphere that they don't really get a good good idea good grasp on the signal coming from outside and if as if that was not enough it turns out jupiter is a very big source also a uh, transmitting source in these events so there have been a lot of missions that have launched dipole antennas and the dipole antennas which are basically dipole antennas are just like a single piece of you know long metal wire uh, those antennas just get uh, get drowned out by the signal from earth the signal from sun and the signal from jupiter and that is so this is even before they they detect the galactic signal the galactic signals is very strong the solar system can be overwhelming exactly exactly so that's why it needs to be targeted and directional to avoid you know you'll still get side lobes and stuff but at least you can yes and that's another thing that the crater helps because we might not be able to take out the side lobes just through rf design but because we are inside a crater we are not by physically we can't see any other part of the sky the right. crater is protecting us in a sense and which is which is why we like this idea a lot yeah yeah that's cool um okay so a number of questions from the from the audience everyone's enthusiastic about this as as am i um alexander gonzales asks what would be the impact of micro meteoroids on the telescope Yeah so I didn't talk about this actually but uh, a telescope of this of wavelengths like 10 meters or longer one of the first things that we can do is make the mesh itself very very uh, very very sparse so you could think of this mesh as like a fishing net so and you know you have these small squares on the fishing net so that the size of the square is now what i'm talking about so for a for a telescope that is observing in 10 meters wavelength or longer if your size of those squares is less than say lambda by 4 you're pretty good if you're la- less than lambda by 10 it's perfect like you don't really need to make it even finer than that so for a 10 meter uh, wavelength um, a 1 meter cross 1 meter uh, you know square which is actually quite a big big thing you can think of 1 meter cross 1 meter is almost our height right so that's how much that's how big uh, there's gap between two wires and these wires are very thin like 1 mm in wire so we the probability of micrometeorite strikes is very low having said that we have done the math and it turns out we do expect around 1 to 2 wire cutting events per per year with this so we have some designs on how to make these wires micrometeorite resistant that is if they have multiple wires going over each other so even though you might cut one wire the right. other wires will still hold on to the structure yeah Yeah that's related to uh, another question asked in the chat and that's what is the material that you'd be using for these cables that would make it you know somewhat resistant to both the temperature strains that you're going to be dealing with as well as micrometeoroid impacts and that sort of thing so we need the material to be conductive because it has to be rf conductive uh the main contenders are usually aluminum and copper because you know the amount of scale of material that we need aluminum has pretty good uh, properties also in those we haven't really frozen on the material yet because as you can see the physics goes through irrespective of whether you use aluminum or copper um my personal gut feeling is we'll most probably go towards aluminum but we haven't really selected the material yet and that's one of the things that i guess mesh design is going to be one of the main things that we are going to be focusing on in this snack phase 2 that we are currently working on Yeah. Yeah. Um let's see. Uh Stephen Schreer asks, would the moon telescope be operated from Earth or via some sort of or- like in situ uh base or via an orbiting mission that's relaying stuff back or like what what Yeah. Term- so, because it's going to be on the far side of the moon, there's most probably not going to be a human base over there anytime in the near future because most human presence would be on the side that you can see from Earth. but it turns out because this is like very close to the equator of the moon if you think of the l2 lagrangian point the so the l2 lagrangian point can be both seen from the crater and can be seen from earth so if you have a telescope if you have a satellite rotating or, or you know orbiting the l2 lagrangian point 
that would give us almost bidirectional communication uh, from earth uh, to uh, to the moon to to the telescope there are i i personally do research in autonomy so i always like autonomy but there are obvious advantages to not put everything on autonomy um and in this particular case uh, if it's a telescope that is stationary uh, there is there is a good chance we would be observed controlling everything from from earth this is like very much like uh, how telescopes are currently many optical telescopes on earth are are you know actually manually controlled say at caltech they would manually send a signal and that would go all the way to mauna kea and and then the telescope would observe something uh it's it's very reminiscent of that uh, i do want to add one more thing uh, nasa did do a lot of work on trying to you know push the technology on tele robotics from space so even though they are planning to build something like a lunar gateway or there might be other or there might be some systems on earth we could potentially do some form of tele robotics also to do this on on the moon so it's it's an open wide space but it's not a technical challenge from what how i see it now okay so in terms of time scale that's totally indeterminate because it just has to be funded by nasa or congress or what not because as you said the price tag is pretty pretty yes. substantial yes I, i would the, guess so. technology is there it's just a matter of funding it so one of the things that we are trying to do right now is is do build the technology like what is it that we need to do and does it answer all the questions does it answer the science question does it answer the can you launch such a thing because one of the things i just didn't show and i said i don't have is a design of a mesh that we can launch and that does satisfy all the things so that's what we are currently working on so once all of those things make sense and we have a design that makes sense so we call that a point design then we can take it to you know the the higher ups and ask for give us money so, so that we can start building the technology but we are not there yet we are still building up what is it that we need and what is the tech do we have a complete solution that answers the entire problem yeah okay um and then the last question that was alluded to by a couple of members of the audience ag and uh and again steven trier is um is there the possibility of building a smaller uh instrument that might fit in a smaller crater and then building from that either because it's cheaper um or or if you have multiple instead of going with the big fixed dish having a bunch of smaller dishes and then you have sort of like a very large array type dish that you can do synthetic synthetic imaging from or something yeah. like that so is that's that, that's, that's a complicated or is that possible no that's that's a cool question and we have been thinking about it uh there are two answers to that so let me first answer from the science point of view so we are interested in wavelengths that are say 10 meters but on the other end we are interested in wavelengths all the way up to 100 meters so now for a dish telescope to make sense there's a rule of thumb i mean i don't have anything better than this it's a rule of thumb that your diameter of your dish should be at least 10 times the wavelength that you're observing because if it's not at least 10 times then your that feed system over there would basically pick up uh, stray signals and you won't get a very good directivity to what you're trying to observe uh so that's why that that upper wavelength is kind of why we need something a uh, kilometer in size um now if you did not have a dish that big you could still get away with uh, say something like a dipole array system and there are some very good ideas on the dipole array system um the reason one of the things that a dish of that big size gives you is the lunar surface itself has some interesting properties that we don't understand so for example on earth if a radio wave hits the earth surface because of humidity the radio wave gets absorbed but on the moon there is not much, there is no humidity so a radio wave would go travel on the lunar dirt hit the lunar bedrock and then come back up and then hit your our receiver system so if you do not have something protecting your receiver system you are going to get all these stray signals coming from all over the universe that that we did not uh, you know we didn't account for so we won't know what we are observing uh, clearly one way to understand it is actually understand what is happening below our telescope which is which is hard which is significantly harder because now we don't really understand and we are trying to take measurements at the same time so the the mesh of this size although it is costly it takes out a very large uncertainty in in these kind of measurement that is we kind of are insulated from all the large noise sources um yeah 
Huh, that's super interesting. Cool, okay, well, um, thank you very much for your talk, Subtarshi, very interesting. Um, I'm glad that we had both you and Sabrina on. And now comes the, the second half or second, the last third or so of our, of our session where we do interactive pub trivia. So Sabrina, come back on, please, if you're there. Hooray, welcome back. Um, okay, so let me share my screen, make sure I'm not sharing all the answers here. Um, so audience members, we are going to do astronomy pub trivia, astronomically themed pub trivia. Yeah. Can you guys see that? Can you see my shared screen? All right, so audience members, if you go to a website in another browser window, menti.com, and then type in this, this code, 48113699, it will bring you to another website where you can answer the pub trivia questions that we are about to do. And when you answer them, they'll pop up on our screen as well. So you can like see how you're doing and we can see how you're doing and, and all of that. Unfortunately, there are no prizes. I can't send out prizes. I don't have a budget to send out prizes to all of you, uh, but your prize will be knowledge and the, the knowledge that you uh, know more than your peers on these topics. So uh, I encourage people not to use, despite having the entire uh, breadth of, of humankind's knowledge at your fingertips with the internet right here, I encourage you to not look things up, uh, look up the answers and instead rely on your own um, background please. Although this is the honor system, so there's really nothing I can do if you choose to do that. Um, all right, so let's see. First question. Mars helicopter Ingenuity has now flown five flights on the surface of Mars. What was its maximum speed thus far? So there's a few different options that you can, that you can choose. Feel free to select the one that you think it is. I think this is super exciting. Uh, this, we've got a helicopter flying around another planet doing tests. So it actually got its um, mission extended. It was only meant to have five separate flights, but it was so successful that they've extended uh, the mission for it by another month. So it should have um, a few more flights and they haven't said yet uh, what, what those flights will be testing, but, but it's pretty exciting nonetheless. Okay, so we've got everything from two miles an hour up to 32 miles an hour as possible answers. And it seems like people are kind of honing in on the three in intermediary ranges of four to 16 miles per hour. What do you guys think, Sabrina, Subtarshi? Any ideas? I haven't been paying attention. <laughs> well, that's okay. No judgment here. I, I wouldn't have known, but yeah, I, I, I always say this. I sound like Alex Trebek. I know all the answers because I wrote the questions. So. <laughs> uh, I, I guessed four miles per hour. I kind of should know this because the, the people who build a Mars helicopter just sit right next to me at lab, but we haven't <laughs> met in a, in a year. So yeah, yeah well, it's, it's, it's very keep, cool. It's hard to keep abreast of your colleagues' work when you're not in the office anymore. But uh, yeah, so very close. The answer is in fact about eight miles per hour. Uh, it achieved that in, in the last flight. And what's cool is we have, uh, so just for, so people know what we're talking about, there's this helicopter that's flying around on Mars. It weighs about four pounds here on earth, but only about um, 1.6 pounds on the surface of Mars. And it has these fast spinning rotors. It's like a little drone um, that's flying and it's powered by some lithium ion batteries that charge by a solar panels, it charges it up and then it can make like a 90 second or so flight for, before it, it runs out of batteries and it has to charge up again for another day or so. But we have a nice video here of the fourth flight. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Of the fourth flight, um, where you know it zooms up. So it's it's over here in the in the lower right. And it's powering up. And the cool part about this is if I didn't mess it up, oh, here's the sound. So you can hear there's a microphone on board. There's actually two microphones on board Perseverance, the rover. And you hear, you hear that humming noise? I don't know, can you guys hear it? Oh, shoot. Well, hopefully our I, audience can hear it. 
I, I don't think the sound is coming through, but you can also go online on YouTube and search this. It's, it's very That's cool. True. Yeah. So essentially there are microphones on board Perseverance. Um, one was helped put there by, um, by one of our previous guests, Jason Achilles, um, who, who joined us a couple of years ago. Um, and essentially it can pick up the sound on the surface of Mars so you can hear the, the, the wind that's impacting the camera or the, uh, the microphone, as well as you hear this humming noise from this super high velocity rotor that's spinning around at about five times as fast as helicopter rotors do here on Earth. And, you know, it, it zips up, you know, 10 or so feet in the air, and then it flies off to the side, and then it comes back. So on the, on the fourth mission, it actually went 250 meters uh, horizontally across the surface and then came back and then landed. And then the fifth, the fifth one, oh yeah, we're getting all these subtitles on our screen. But um, nonetheless, the fifth mission or the fifth test went 100 meters and it landed somewhere else, which of course is another challenge, right? Because you don't know if the surface is going to be okay to land. Um, and then I don't know what's going to happen on future missions, but presumably they're going to test out going at faster speeds, traveling at larger distances, being able to take pictures of, of the surface in different, oh, here it comes. Hey, little guy, he's coming back. So it's super cool and it's totally autonomous, you know, much like the work that you said you're doing, Saptarshi, like it's, it's operating autonom autonomously because, you know, Mars is 15 light minutes away from us. So we can't be, you know, sit there with a joystick and like play with this thing in real time. We just have to program it to figure out what's going on. I think this is super, super badass. So, all right. So good job, everybody. Um, yeah, definitely check out that, uh, check out that video if you can't. What, how do I get out of this? Let's go to the next. Okay. Next question. How long does it take light created in the core of the sun to eventually percolate out and reach its surface? So we have a bunch of different options. Whoa, somebody jumped right in with a million years. So we've got everything from instantaneously up to a million years, or even we don't know. Who knows? Do you know? Oh, we've got all kinds of answers here. It's a scattershot field here. Everybody's all over the board. What do you guys think? It's okay. Again, no judgment here. These are these are challenging questions. <laughs> I think it's a million years or more because the internal structure of sun is very opaque. It's pretty opaque. dense. It's pretty opaque in there. Yeah, it is. So it turns out, depending on where you look online, actually, you get a range of values because the, the problem is we don't we don't fully understand the interior of the sun, of the sun right so in some ways the people who answered we don't know like yeah that's uh, that's not that's not a bad guess I, I guess you could say that as a correct answer to a lot of the questions we have about the cosmos but um, but it's we, we know it's not instantaneously and we not we know it's not 2.3 seconds either even though the surface is only 2.3 light seconds away from the core, the light doesn't free stream across that because it's constantly bumping into um, atomic nuclei in the core. And so whenever it hits one, it, it probably either scatters off or gets absorbed by it and then gets re-emitted. So it's, it, it, um, it slowly percolates out. So the answer uh, in doing a little bit of calculation and poking around a bit seems closer to like 10,000 to 100,000 years, um, not quite as long as a, as a million, but Essentially what's happening is, you know, you've got nuclear fusion occurring in the core that releases, you know, gamma rays, super, super high energy photons in the core. But they, as I said, it's so dense there that they immediately run into another uh, nucleus and get absorbed and then get re-emitted. And so people refer to this as a random walk. They also call it a drunken walk. So if you get, you know, you go to astronomy on tap and you get really sloshed and then you're trying to walk around and you're like you walk a little bit this way and then you walk about a little bit this way and it takes you a long time to make any real progress towards something because you keep going back and forth and that's what this illustration is meant to uh 
is meant to represent is that it takes a long time to eventually percolate out through all these scattering events off of atomic nuclei until you get to uh, the convective region, at which point that, that's where there's large gas flows that essentially carry the photons out and carry the, the photonic energy to the surface, where eventually it's so low um, opacity, it's so transparent that it can just free stream out towards the Earth. And then it's only like eight minutes of travel once you get out of the surface to get to the Earth, even though it's a, it's a much larger distance, but there's just not as much stuff in the way as there is in the core. So yeah, the answer is like 10,000-ish, but I'll still give credit to we don't know because we don't fully know like a total description of the interior in terms of densities and pressures throughout the various different regions. Okay, well, I like this one too. Who was the inventor of the telescope? What do people think? No, no multiple choice here. Now you just got to enter whatever you think, whatever you think it is. Galileo, Freddie Mercury, a good one, good <laughs> one. Kepler, I like it. Ooh, Galileo, period. Someone is really serious about that answer. Serious. Herschel, fair, good guesses. Oh, look at this guy. Somebody's, somebody's really knows, knows the business. Lee Winhoek. If it was Galileo, then why haven't we named a telescope after him? Have we? Ah, uh, that, ooh, John Telescope. Oh, uh, now somebody's putting spam in here. That's great. Thanks, spam, spam, spam master. Um, that is a good question. I am sure there must be a Galileo tes telescope, probably in Italy. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know of any Galileo space telescopes, but I may just be totally ignorant and everyone's gonna say, of course you dummy, there's the Galileo space telescope. But uh, okay, some good guesses here. The answer is challenging. Nobody guessed it. I wouldn't have either. Don't, I'm not some genius who knows that Hans Lippershey uh, is the answer. I only know it because I looked it up. So um, he was, a, he was a, a, Dutch, a Dutch gentleman from uh, about 400 years ago who was uh, dealt with optical instruments. And he was the first person to make a telescope basically by putting two lenses uh, separated by a distance and you know the light passes through the objective and it goes to the eyepiece and then it focuses on the eye and when you use a this is the objective here is a convex lens and the eyepiece is a concave lens and the nice thing about this is that it doesn't invert your image whereas if you use two convex lenses you'll invert your image which is usually how telescopes are now if you're using um uh a lensed telescope in this capacity and so everything you know Sometimes you'll pick up a telescope, I don't know, you get a cheap telescope online or something like that and point it, point it at a distant uh, pirate ship, the pirate ship will be inverted. Or, or if you're looking at a bird in a tree, you're like, why the heck is that bird upside down? But that's how it, how it is with, uh, with two lenses that look like this, these convex lenses. But anyway, uh, Hans was able to make a telescope that, that magnified things by about three times, which, you know, good job, good job, guy made your first telescope and it magnifies. But um, Galileo built one and he improved on this dramatically and got it up to magnifications of 30 or so times. And um, I think his aperture, the largest aperture he got was a few inches across, like four inches maybe. So he was able to collect a lot more light, see a lot fainter things. And thus he was the first person to, to point it at the heavens and be able to make some astronomical discoveries with it. Like what's the surface of the moon look like? What uh, what are the objects that are orbiting around Jupiter, which are now named the Galilean moons because they're the brightest moons and they're named after him, which is, you know, pretty cool. I want to get stuff named after me. I want to have moons named after me. Maybe, maybe Subtarshi, you'll have the, uh, the, the, the lunar crater radio telescope named after you. That'd be the Subtarshi telescope. That'd be pretty sweet. I hope I'm alive when, when I see it. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, okay. Oh, there's always a Star Wars question. I'm sorry, always a Star Wars question because I, I like Star Wars. In Star Wars, Cloud City was located on what planet? What do you guys think? 
what planet? I only know one planet. Then. Which which planet do you know, Sabrina? Tatooine. But Tatooine. It's only from this um, astronomy on tap that I know the name of that. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I watched the movies. It's been a really long time, though. Yeah, I realize people aren't just sitting. There. I mean, some people are. I am. But most people aren't sitting there watching them like, must memorize the planets in the Star Wars universe, a totally fictional universe that has no you know, pragmatic use in any capacity. One thing I would like to note though, since Tatooine just popped up, I just got the California license plate Tatooine for my car. I'm so psyched. I'm so psyched. Um, unfortunately, you can only use seven characters. So it's Tatooine instead of Tatooine. So some somebody's gonna think like, maybe I'm a tattoo artist or something, but I'm okay with that. Ooh, you loud. should just put a sticker. It's an E. Oh, add a little E on the end. That's a good <laughs> idea. I like that. Uh, in a galaxy far away. Ooh, Lucas won. I like that. I like that. So indeed, most people got the correct answer here. Bespin. Here's a nice little uh, uh, illustration of, of this taken from Empire Strikes Back. And yeah, so the idea is that you know, Bespin is some sort of cloud, like gas giant, you know, like Jupiter or Saturn, where there isn't really a surface, you know, people think like, oh, look, look, it's Jupiter in the sky. We're not looking at the surface. We're looking at the upper layer of the atmosphere, you know, the clouds and such. So if you tried to like step on the, the surface, you just fall through just like you would if you tried to step in these clouds here. And so the way, at least in the Star Wars universe, that they overcome this and still have inhabit, you know, like domiciles and whatnot, is they have this floating city that's just hanging out at the upper layer of the atmosphere. And, um, you know, we could do that. You could do that at the upper layer of Jupiter or Saturn or Uranus. Of course, at the upper layer of Jupiter, you know, the surface gravity is still really high because Jupiter is really massive, right? So it's still two and a half times gravity, two and a half Gs that are pulling you down, even when you're you know, kind of hovering in this little space city that's hanging out in the upper atmosphere. So I don't know about you. I wouldn't want to weigh two and a half times my weight. I wouldn't want to weigh, you know, 375 pounds, just like, oh, oh my God, this is, this is so rough, but you could do it. But Saturn and, and Neptune and Uranus have, have surface gravities that are much closer to, um, to Earth's gravity. It's like 1.1 G. So that wouldn't be so bad. Of course, you couldn't breathe that air either. So anyway, I just like this because it's like kind of sci-fi, but kind of, you know, tenable future, maybe. Uh, sweet Millennium Falcon here, though. That's pretty good. Okay. What fraction of the moon do we see from here on Earth related to the, to the talk that we just heard from Subtarshi? Like, do we see half the moon? Do we see the whole moon? Do we see less than half of the moon, maybe a quarter of the moon? What do you guys think? Ooh, 70%, 89%, I like that, 89, it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little more than half, half, 50%. The fraction. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what fraction that is, but I like it. There's a lot of options here. A lot of options. People are going with 50%, but I still, I think my favorite is still the action fraction. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Okay. What do you guys, what do you guys think? Subtarshi, I know you know the answer because you wrote this question. I feel like it's more than 50 yeah, you're right. You are absolutely right. The answer is 59% and a nice illustration. Subtarshi, you want to uh, explain what's what's up here? What's going on? Sure. So turns out uh, moon, in addition to going around Earth, so this is the moon, by the way, uh, in addition to going around Earth, uh, there's also an interesting thing it does. It, it, it rotates a little bit like this. And this is around five degrees. So... In that, it does that in around some 18 years. So in an 18 year cycle, it does a little bit five degrees up, five degrees down. So although we technically should observe only 50% of the moon at any one time, because of this small rotation up and down, we end up seeing around 59% of the moon. Uh, it's, it's very cool. 
And, and that, effect is, that effect is called what? There, there are a bunch of different terms. Like if you, if you look at it from orbital mechanics point of view, it's called nutation. There is a for on lunar, on lunar stuff. It's called liberation. Uh, yeah, you you could basically prove it also is, is some form of centripetal force. So if you look at it also from just physics point of view, it's it's actually quite a lot of terms. Basically, depending on which community you want to talk to. Uh, but the liberation is the word that's usually used in for moon. Yes. Will it ever? Will it ever dissipate? Like, is this just a transient state, and eventually it'll totally become locked, and you won't have any kind of liberation? Actually, uh, to be precise, the moon is actually moving away from Earth, and that is because the system is constantly losing energy every time there's a tide, and then the tide goes away. The system is losing energy. And so with time, moon will move away from Earth. So this and uh, all the other features actually um, might dissipate. Uh, depend, this is actually not a very energy efficient system. So huh. I don't know about this particular system, but it might even lose its, you know, tidal lock capability someday. Oh, Distant future, not right now. Yeah, like yeah, say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I honestly don't know. I don't know, but that's really cool. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay, moving on to our next question. After the sun and the planets, what is the largest body in the solar system? It's a tricky question. Tricky question. What do people think? You got the sun, you got the eight planets, Ooh, Pluto, lol. <laughs> Ceres, a good option. The largest of the asteroid belt. Pluto, everybody loves Pluto. Uh, Trump, not everybody loves Trump. Um, let's see. Halley's Comet, Halley's Comet. Indeed, that's, a, that's an option. The asteroid belt, the Oort cloud. Okay, sweet. The Oort cloud, the outer solar system where comets are coming from. Titan, uh, one of the moons around Saturn. Ganymede, one of the moons around Jupiter. Saturn's rings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Jupiter's magnetic field, that's a good one. What do you guys think? And again, it's fine. I, I, I probably wouldn't have known either, so I'm, I'm a cheater. I, just I thought cool. it was Ganymede. Hmm. That is a that is a fine guess, and you are correct, sir. You are correct. Um, yeah, Ganymede is is pretty big. It's kind of funny, right? Because you think Titan, Titan, Titan's named Titan because it's so big, but it's actually the second largest uh, moon in the solar system after Ganymede. Um, Ganymede being the largest of the of going back to our previous question of one of the Galilean moons that orbits around Jupiter. It turns out. All of those moons, the, the four moons, major moons around Jupiter are the are amongst the largest bodies in the solar system after planets. So yeah, so good job, Ganymede. Rocking it. Rocking it. Okay. Let's move on. Ooh, Sophia question. Which Star Trek alum flew on Sophia in 2015? What do you guys think? Mixing it up, Star Wars and Star Trek and the same astronomy on tap. This is outrageous, <laughs> outrageous. But uh, I think this is pretty exciting, Star Trek. Oop, hard, yes. C-3PO, somebody's mixing it up, sweet. George Takei, that's a good guess. That guy's awesome. Nichelle Nichols, yeah, Lieutenant Uhuru. Yeah, I don't know Star Trek that well. I mean, I've watched some. I watched the classic series and some of TNG. It's good. But uh, ooh, Boba Fett, yes. Mandalorians, Unite. Leonard no. Nemo, good guess. Spock. I wish Baby Yoda had flown. Baby <laughs> Yoda. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay. The answer is indeed Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura, um so were you were you on this mission sabrina were you up there with her 
No, I, this was two years before I started at Sophia. Um, but I know a lot of people who took, I mean, she took pictures with everybody. I mean, she seemed so nice. She seems awesome. Her. Yeah. Like all the stuff I've seen of her as an actress is just incredible. I mean, she was like basically the first major black female actress in the world with the stuff that she was doing in, in the classic series of Star Trek. So like, yeah, she's amazing. She's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to get my picture taken with her. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Last week, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the first American in space. Who was it? 60 years ago, May 5th, 1961. God, it's been a long time. Alan Shepard, good guess. Alan Shepard, different spelling, John Glenn. Ooh, what else have we got here? Leonard Nimoy, oh, John Glenn, different spelling. A man, it's true, it was in fact a man. The first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova was mid 60s, early 60s. The first American female in space Sally Ride wasn't until the 80s, which is really a shame that it took, you know, 20 years of space flight before the Americans put a, a woman in space, but making up for lost time. Ham the chimpanzee. Okay, that's pretty good. Yuri Gagarin. Let's see. Shepard Glenn, not Yuri. Ooh, Yuri Alexandrovich Gagarin. Indeed. Indeed. Yuri was, in fact, the first person in space um, about a month before Alan Shepard got up there. So Alan Shepard went up May 5th. Yuri went up like April. Somebody correct me. I feel like it was the second week in April, April 6th. I'm sure somebody will shame me by not knowing the exact date of Yuri's night. But um, yes, yeah, so Yuri went up in April. Um, he actually did one full orbit of the Earth and came down. And then Alan Shepard went up a few weeks later. He did a suborbital flight. So these are the kind of flights that you can get if you pay um, Richard Branson a lot of money uh, with, uh, what's his what's his space flight company? Do you guys remember? Virgin Galactic. Oh, Virgin Galactic. Yeah, Virgin <laughs> Galactic. Nominally, you'll be able to do these suborbital flights where you, you, God, there's loud helicopters overhead. Crime is happening in Pasadena. Um, so instead of doing a full orbit, he did like, he went on a ballistic trajectory and like came in. I don't remember the exact trajectory, but he was only out for like 15 minutes. And then Gus Grissom was on the second Mercury flight, another American a few months later, also did a suborbital flight. So it wasn't until John Glenn, which people put, that was the third American in space. And that was a, again, a full orbital flight, but that was for several months later. So I guess we'll accept both Alan as well as John because Alan, you know, Alan was the first dude in space, but it was just this kind of dinky little suborbital flight. It was only like 15 minutes, but uh, anyway, anyway. Good questions, good answers, people. Uh, yesterday, a Chinese rocket had an uncontrolled re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Where did it land? This was, this was all over the news. In the Indian Ocean, whoa, Indian Ocean. Any other options? Um, yeah, this is pretty exciting business. Indian Ocean near Maldives, indeed. Okay. Earth, that's a good, that's a good catch-all. Beijing. It did not, in fact, I'll 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 spoiler that. It did not in fact land in Beijing. That would have been pretty problematic. Near Italian coast. I was hoping it would hit me so I wouldn't have to do this talk. <laughs> oh, really? I think you did a great job, Sabrina. This was I, excellent. Thank you. But uh, I was very nervous. So, well, I think you did great. And we got a lot of positive comments in the both the Facebook Live as well as the YouTube Live saying you did an excellent presentation. Both of you uh, doing excellent. Outback Steakhouse Maldives. Excellent. <laughs> that one's really good. Um, yeah, so indeed, the answer is near the Maldives. So the Maldives are in the Indian Ocean, uh, near the subcontinent of India. 
This is an image of the, uh, the rocket that took off. The rocket type is the Long March 5B. So essentially the, the Chinese are building a station, uh, a space station in, in orbit, super awesome. But in order to build a station, you gotta get stuff up there and then put it all together and have it orbiting. And they've come in under a little bit of fire because not only did they send their rocket up and sent, you know, jettison their, their, their component to make part of this station, but they just let their, you know, rocket shell, which is like 20 tons, just like, oh, well, it's gonna end up somewhere. It's probably the ocean because there's a lot of the earth's surface that's covered in the ocean. And it came down and it's like one of the most massive, largest things to re-enter the atmosphere on like an uncontrolled, uh, just uncontrolled re-entry. And fortunately, there haven't been any like, the Maldives haven't made any public statement, which probably means there were no people that, who, who were killed as a, as, a result of, bleh, as a result of this impact. But, you know, it's not good to just drop 20 ton things into the, uh, onto the surface of the earth. Let's see, what do we got here? Didn't they yeah, do they, that with the ISS? Uh, they just kind of let no, it burn? So you didn't, you didn't do, for, for previous missions, um, for the most part, people are being pretty good about you bring stuff up and you take the rocket and give it a, um, a little bit, you save a little bit more fuel and kick it back into the atmosphere where you know exactly where it's going to land. Like I'm going to send this into the South Pacific where it's not going to slam into an island or something like that. And we can either let it sink or recover it or whatever. But this is just like, well, hope it doesn't hit something. And then you know, you could be walking down the beach in this five-star hotel on the white sands of the Maldives on your, you know, your, your expensive vacation. And then boom, you get hit by a chunk of a Chinese rocket shell. It's not what you want. It's not what I want. Um, so there's been, there's been some, some uh, critical response to how this was treated because there will be future, more future missions that are going to be putting stuff into space and hopefully it's done in a in a slightly more responsible way where there's not risk of damage or loss of life. So anyway, I think those are, yeah, those are all the questions. All the questions. So thank you everybody for participating in our Astronomy on Tap pub trivia. I hope it seemed like people did a pretty good job, especially um, uh, Outback Steakhouse Maldives. That was an excellent, excellent question, uh, excellent response. Um, yeah, I guess that's what we've got for tonight. We're ending a little bit early. Do you guys want to add anything? Any? Oh, uh, add this was very nice. Uh, thanks for inviting us. And oh, sure. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad uh, glad to have you guys. Um, so, as a reminder to our audience, our next event next Monday we will have an astronomy on tap that is entirely in Spanish language. So, if you speak Spanish and you like astronomy. Um, or if you know people who also fit those, those categories, please spread the word. It is in our, our both our Facebook as well as our YouTube and so on and so forth. And I will not be the host because I don't speak Spanish very well, but there will be excellent hosts, uh, two graduate students um, in, in astronomy and planetary science who are here at Caltech who will be hosting. And our speakers will be Luis Mas Ribas, a JPL uh, postdoc who is going to talk about miniature black holes, the search for miniature black holes in our own solar system, and a, a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History, um, Dr. Daniela Gagliuffi, who will be talking about brown dwarfs that should be super interesting. So I encourage you to come back next Monday night and we will have a lecture a week from Friday on neutron stars and pulsars given by Dr. Amruta Zaudand, uh, that should be super cool. So she's, she's a great speaker. She's been a guest before, but she will be giving the talk. And come back in a month for our fifth year anniversary. I don't know what the heck we're gonna do, but, but it should be fun. So uh, thank, thank you audience for sticking around this long. Thank you speakers. Uh, it was great to have you guys here. And I, yeah, we'll see, you, we'll see you guys, everybody next month. Thanks everybody.